So there's national programs, which I think Polenberg does a very good job explaining what these programs are supposed to, were supposed to do. But uh, historians who've gone deeper into the ground, the New Deal in California, the New Deal in the South, the New Deal in the Midwest, the New Deal in New York, have found that in practice, the New Deal can be very different things in different places was very different things in very different places. Um, and that a program might be intended to do, uh, achieve certain results, but would be administered by state and local governments to achieve, to, for very different purposes. So in that sense, there were at the very least 48 different New Deals that reflected the political realities of each state. Uh, in addition to all this, while Roosevelt is largely seen as having led an activist administration, uh, the periods of intense policy making and crafting of new legislation were extremely limited. The first 100 days of Roosevelt's administration in 1933 were intense and hectic, and then it became a question of an of uh, administering the program, setting them up, and fighting off your political enemies. And then the second period of intense legislative activity occurred in 1937. The New Deal had three distinct phases. Let's see if we, we'll get... The first uh, was dealing with the immediate problem and set up a uh, past programs which were set up to build a cooperative economy in which government, uh, business, and labor would uh, develop a managed economy. It was essentially Roosevelt's new nationalism, the first Roosevelt, Theodore Roosevelt, plus the experience of World War I, wartime planning. That, uh, that uh, part of the New Deal was declared unconstitutional by the, or the cornerstone uh, legislation of that part of the New Deal was declared unconstitutional by the Supreme Court. We'll get into that a little bit. And, and uh, Roosevelt retrenched, and instead of managing the economy directly, he strengthened the regulatory powers of the government. Uh, by, this, by 1936, uh, when he was reelected, the economy was getting back to something similar to normal. And unemployment had gone down to about 12%. And uh, Roosevelt re uh, retrenched to a standard Democratic Party position at that time of uh, balanced budgets and low taxes which pushed the country back into a deep recession with unemployment uh, increasing again. So Roosevelt responded to that problem uh, by abandoning, uh, not abandoning the regulatory phase, but by abandoning ba the balanced budget principle and just going into, the, uh, into activities that were pump priming, spending as much money as possible and cutting taxes. And then, of course, in 1940, there was the shift into a war economy, which finally brought uh, uh, the country back into full production and uh, uh, ended unemployment, brought unemployment down to below 3%. So let's go back. Your, the programs that one would follow uh, adopt for addressing the depression would have to have a sense of what the major factors were. So I want to evaluate these. This is a summary. This will all be up on, on the B space so you can go back to it. But financial speculation, high debt loads, income inequality increasing, slower rates of productivity, aging capital stock and infrastructure, and, and decreased investment in research and development or slowing down investment. All of these were important factors that the government, uh, that Roosevelt felt he had to deal with. In addition, there were the aggravating factors. 
That is, the factors that were not the result of structural problems that would have to work themselves out of time, over time, but of stupid decisions made by uh, Congress and the previous administration, Hoover's administration, or by uh, the Federal Reserve. So deflation, the tightening of credit, the passing of the Smoot-Hawley Tariff Act, with the purpose of closing US markets to most foreign goods. The, the spread of the recession of the depression worldwide. And the inability uh, of uh, anybody to uh, know who was going to be hurt, that it was no longer possible to make sure that only those who had been irresponsible would feel the pain. The pain became generalized and punished uh, the virtuous as well as the reckless. Uh, and there seemed to be no set of policies that could separate out uh, the reckless and make sure that they got the punishment, economic punishment they deserved so that the virtuous could then pick themselves up and move forward. Um, so, addressing the problems of uh, and I'm, I'm trying to break this down into sort of major things that they wanted to deal with. And I want, I'm putting in also what Hoover did because in some respects there was continuity, particularly in the first problem, which was one of financial speculation and the banking crisis and the lack of credit. Hoover had all, the Congress under Hoover had already passed the most important piece of legislation that gave Roosevelt most of the powers he needed to manage the banking crisis. The Glass-Steagall Banking Act of 1932 prevented commercial banks, that is the banks that, were, that you go to for your checking account and your ATM card, those, banking, those banks could no longer have anything to do with the stock market or speculative investments. Uh, they were there to give, uh, to op hold uh, savings and checkings accounts and to make personal or business loans uh, backed up with um, mortgages. It prohibited commercial banks um, uh, from underwriting or promoting stock purchases. And investment banks were then to be the banks that focused on risky investments, but the le legislation required investment banks to share in the risk. One of the major problems in the, at the beginning of the depression was companies that went bankrupt because they had mortgages due to banks that they could no longer pay. Had uh, the investment bank uh, carried some of the risk, many of those companies, not all, but many of them would have survived. And their assets would not have been liquidated as they were. Uh, and uh, there were, uh, was there a question? Sorry, OK. And then the Glass-Steagall Act uh, set uh, standards for uh, the balance between assets, a bank's assets, and its, uh, its, uh, the loans that it could make. So, uh, and it also provided federal guarantees. So right now, I think all of us have $100,000 uh, guaranteed uh, for the accounts that we have. From if a bank collapses, the federal government will give us up to $100,000 of the losses that we might have, uh, would have suffered otherwise. Uh, the limits initially were much lower, of course. Uh, and the Federal Reserve Board gained a, a lot of power to begin to uh, regulate monetary supply in a way that's more like what we understand today. Um, the second uh, thing that Hoover did was the Home Financing Corporation, which was a federal bank that was created to provide federal guarantees for home mortgages. The FHA, essentially, is the, the Federal Housing Authority, is the, what, what it would become after Roosevelt became president. So FDR came in with the bank, uh, banking system collapsing. 
His very first act as president was to shut down all the banks in the country. Uh, he proclaimed a bank holiday. He was using powers that had been given to the president by the Glass-Steagall Act. Uh, so the banks were closed down for four business days. In this period, uh, this was, the Congress was working on an emergency relief act followed by the Banking Act of 1933. So the federal government essentially nationalized all financial transactions in March of 1933. All banks uh, were put on probation. There had to be, their assets had to be audited and their liabilities were audited and the government would decide which banks could reopen and which banks would be shut down. And for those banks that were shut down, the government would then pay off uh, the liabilities of the depositors and would write off the loans that uh, the bank had uh, made. Uh, secondly, the FDR had, uh, the, um, uh, had the Securities and Exchange Commission established with authority over all stock market activities. So no stock, ex no stock activities, no stock could be offered without the federal government reviewing that stock offer and the, pro the prospectus that the company was, uh, was uh, claiming. And if the, the government felt that, this, uh, that the stock offering was risky, then it, uh, approval would be denied. Uh, and as also part of this legislation, there were uh, strong limits on the use of credit in buying stock. So in a sense, uh, banking and the stock market were separated uh, by both Hoover and Roosevelt. Uh, and also at this time, one of the limitations was that no commercial bank could operate in more than one state. So there were, uh, uh, this would be, uh, this would be, Elimit this restriction would be eliminated in the early 1980s after Ronald Reagan became president. But it was, uh, in part, a, a way of stabilizing regional markets, but it was also a way of buy getting a tacit support from bankers. So if you were a banker in Omaha, you would stop worrying about bankers from uh, Chicago or New York or San Francisco coming in and stealing your markets you uh, were in charge of Nebraska. So uh, it, it, was a, uh, it provided some stability. It also slowed down, to some degree, slowed down uh, the whole economy. And this was one of, the, uh, one of Roosevelt's, the Democratic Party or the F New Deal conceptions is that the Depression had been a factor in the depression had been the economy getting overheated, so you needed to have breaks within the economy to slow it down. That corporations should be happier with a lower rate of return, and the wealthy should be happier with diminished but more secure income. So you would put limits on uh, the activity, the speculative activity and the speculative potential within the economy. And equally important as part of the nationalization of